Welcome to episode four of My Life Stories, which concludes my professional career in the music industry. There were several challenging periods when hard decisions had to be made. One such decision was how could we possibly serve the Lord in full-time ministry when we'd lost just about everything we had worked so hard for during our 10 years in America. We were left with only a fistful of dollars. So, could we believe that God would provide for us now that we wanted to join Mercy Ships full-time as volunteers? Because we had to raise our own financial support. Or should we take a millionaire's offer to go back into producing music full-time for a secure wage and live in a rent-free home? So having experienced volunteering for three months on board the Anastasia ship, helping the poor and the needy, yeah, this was our heart's desire. We absolutely loved that time. Here is our account of how the Lord brought myself, Leslie, our two sons, Luke and Joel, and Rebecca, our new addition to the Condor family, to where we are today. Let's pick that up from here. I was listening to this uh, Don Stevens speaking on the WCIE radio that they were in the port of Tampa. The ship was called the Anastasis, and they were on their way uh, to go back to Jamaica, following up on their first trip after Hurricane Gilbert had struck the island and devastated a lot of the Caribbean islands. And they were doing repair work there, were doing medical work as well, and rebuilding homes and schools, and a lot of really good things. And they're, uh, they're a voluntary organization. So people working on the ship were all volunteers, and they were doing an amazing job. I found this so fascinating, and as the ship was docked at that time in Tampa Bay, I was so intrigued that I called the ship up and I said, look, you know, I've been listening to what Don Stevens has been talking about on the radio. I'd love to come there and film him, if that's all right. You know, as I said, it was something that I've never experienced before where you find people who work as volunteers, not getting paid, and give up their time. And there were people like doctors, nurses, dentists, uh, builders, uh, people who just had a heart, who wanted to help to feed the communities, feed the poor, help those uh, who couldn't help themselves, especially after such a devastation uh, that uh, Hurricane Gilbert had caused. Anyway, this is the first time for me I was hearing about this organization known as Mercy Ships, uh, Youth with a Mission. And as I said, I was so impressed that I went down to the ship, did my little bit of interviews. Uh, I, I actually warned them. I said, look, I've just bought this camera. I haven't got a clue what I'm doing with it. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to try and interview you if you would allow me to because I want to let other people know about your story. And so uh, when um, I went down there and I did all the filming and uh, did the interview, I mean, I was all right, Charlie, I'll tell you. But anyway, the thing is that I had a proper kit and stuff and I did it the best job I, was, I could do. But one of the crew said to me, oh, do you know, Howard, We've been praying for a cameraman to come with us on our return trip to Jamaica. And I think you're it. <laughs> I said, thanks very much. Uh, so um, I said, yeah, I'll do it. It is unbelievable that I actually said that because I was earning then about $500 a day in the studio. I mean, it was a lot of money for like 30 years ago, wasn't it? You know, so it's a lot of money, anyway. So for me to say I'm going to give 10 days of my time for free was like, ooh. Um, anyway, I was so impressed with the ship. I went back to Leslie and I told her, and Leslie said, yeah, yeah, do it. Absolutely, go, go with them. So bless her heart, I went and joined them for the 10 days, saw what they were doing. You know, I just tell you, yeah. Uh, I, I, by the way, I flew down there. The ship had already set sail um, a lot earlier than me uh, arriving. I was just seeing all of the people 
doing what they were doing, as I say, from building homes that had blown away in the hurricane, um, the people in the operating theater that needed help, you know, that had broken arms and legs or whatever. But all these dedicated volunteers on the ship, you know, and I just, I went back to Tampa, Florida, and I just said, you know, uh, look at this, Leslie. We need to join this ship. We need to go there. And she said to me, bye. <laughs> uh, she wasn't having any of it at that stage. And um, so I said a little prayer to God. I said, I'll tell you what, Lord, you work on her heart, you change her mind. And I think we should go and join Mercy Ships full time. I, this for me was something I couldn't believe my own ears that I was actually saying this. Here I have the most amazing studio, all the latest toys, and I'm going, forget that, give up the studio and go and join an organization where you don't get paid, but you can do the will of God. And, uh, and, I, and I just was so keen to do it. Now, Leslie, when I came back with the raw tapes and I came back from Jamaica and, and then I'd said, you know, we, we must give up studio and let's go. And she said, goodbye. Uh, she said, but look, okay, why don't we do this album that we were about to uh, be booked for an album which was gonna bring us in $50,000. That's again, a lot of money uh, for the, all that time ago to make an album with these, this particular a set of musical artists who wanted to record in our studios. And I said, I remember the scripture saying, you know, when Jesus was talking uh, to his disciples or would be disciples, he said, right, come and join me. And some were saying, oh, I just need to go and bury my dad, or I just need to go and do this, or I need to go to this far country. I need to make excuses why they couldn't join right there and then. And I used that as an argument to Leslie that we need to go now. Otherwise, if we do the album, then something else will come up and something else and something else and we'll, we'll never make it, okay? So we've got to go now. And within a couple of days, especially when I showed her the videos that I'd shot, she just said, let's go. Now, I tell you, there's not many women in the world who would do that, okay? Give up their home, give up a really lucrative business and just stop what they were doing and uh, join Youth with a Mission, YWAM, as it's affectionately known, and uh, serve the Lord and rather than looking after our own needs. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. I think so. What I wanted to do next before we went to make inquiries about joining uh, Messy Ships full time is I wanted to make a video of what I'd shot and with the help of another cameraman as well who was on the ship. And together we'd made lots of different uh, videos of the ministry that um, Youth with a Mission Y1 were doing, Mercy Ships. There was a piece of music that I'd recorded with Jenny Grind, Stronger Than Before. The music fitted perfectly what I'd been shooting in Jamaica. I went to Carpenter's Home Church, um, which had a, a television studio, and they were well equipped. So, yeah, and I met this guy called Paul Cleath, who worked out at the Carpenter's Home Church in Lakeland. I showed him the footage, the rough cuts of what I'd shot. He was blown away and he said he would help me put it all together because he was an editor as well. And I played him the music track stronger than before. I said, I want the video to be pasted on top, as it were, to make it a music video. We eventually put it together and it turned out to be such a success, that video. I'd already sent the tape off to Mercy Ships for them to do their own editing, but this was my own little production that I wanted to put together. And I remember actually taking it to the guy I would bought all the camera equipment from, and I played it to him, and he looked at it and he went, there is not one dollar sign 
on that at all. I said, what do you mean? He said, you did that for nothing. Yeah, he said, I could tell uh, because of the actual, um, what I'd captured on there. Mercy Ships actually, when I sent it to them separately, they used it to raise funds. So when people came on the ship, which they would have from time to time, or when they did a fundraising in different ports, they would play that video. And it moved the hearts of many people uh, to actually um, donate. So what happens next? We needed to raise our own financial support somehow. So it meant selling the studio. And I can remember that everybody on board the ship, uh, they don't get paid, as I said, uh, they're all volunteers. Um, so we have to raise our own financial supports. Sometimes you do it through your local church and the church they were, we were attending um, weren't really interested in, in that ministry. So therefore they didn't support us. So I said, okay, don't worry. Um, we'll, we'll sell the musical equipment. Now there was a band that, that were using our studios and they loved what we did. And when they heard that I was going to sell the studios, they brought in this guy called Jim McCulloch. He was a millionaire, and uh, or so I was told. And he was going to buy the equipment uh, for these, this group of people to actually um, make a studio with themselves. And also at the same time, we needed to sell our home and uh, we fortunately found somebody to uh, buy our house or take over the mortgage you can assume it assume the mortgage which is very different to how things work in the uk um, so that was that side dealt with but now we need to sell the studio brought in this guy called jim mccullough he was able to fund them and this is how it worked he wasn't prepared to pay outright for all the kit because we probably had around about $400,000 worth of kit. And, uh, you know, so we came to an arrangement that Jim would pay monthly and have a five-year contract. We did it all through lawyers. Five-year contract, paying monthly, divided by the sums that, whatever it was we agreed on, it was a lot of money. So that was something which took care of that as far as I was concerned. And we could serve the Lord by using our own funds that were coming every month. And that would probably last us for five years uh, anyway. So it meant we could do ministry for the next five years. So the guys uh, who wanted to use our equipment, they took it all away. We ended up um, Losing money. How did we do that? Well, basically, you can have uh, the best studio equipment in the world, but if you don't know how to use it, what good is that? Okay, and I found out that we've been on Mercy Ships for two months, and we'd only received two monthly payments from Jim McCullough, and they stopped. And so on the third month and thereafter, we were running out of money. Uh, we didn't have any money. Um, we came back uh, from our outreach of, uh, it's a DTS, Discipleship Training School, that we were on the Mercy Ships. And you have to go through the school process in order to work full time for them. So it's a training uh, school. And just to make sure that you know the basics of the Bible and everything else. Well, to be honest, I knew, I knew the Bible quite well, um, and I was getting on. I must have been in my mid to late forties, maybe. Um, and this was around about 1990, 89, 89, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we had uh, hundreds of thousand pounds for the kit. So, I don't know. But the console uh, that we had was very interesting. Yeah, the recording console we had was a Trident A range. Anybody who knows the business, especially in that time, a Trident A range was uh, made by Markham Toft and it was in uh, Trident Studios in Wardour Street, I think it was in uh, London. 
and uh, Markham Toff made this specially for them. It recorded Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. It recorded uh, all the early stuff of David Bowie, Elton John, loads of major hits were made on this recording console. It's a big, long desk, huge desk. Uh, you see it in the video. And I would say that um, when we first were given the desk, it was in really poor condition. And um, I managed to get another desk, which was uh, serial number three. Ours wasn't a serial number because it wasn't meant to be sold. So it didn't have a serial number, it was supposed to be original. So I put uh, the, the, the first desk that came out of Trident Studios, uh, put it together with the, the number three desk, which came from South Africa. We put $100,000 into repairing these desks, bringing them back to their, their glory days of uh, electronically speaking. Uh, visually, they didn't look that brilliant at the time, but the electronically, they were so good and so sound. And desks at that time were selling like this, they were 250,000. Now I got two of them strapped together, so at least they must have been worth 250,000. But what happened is some bright sparks, supposedly from level 42, the band at the time, supposedly, because it turned out he wasn't from them, by the way, had uh, got whispered in Jim McCulloch's ear, this desk is a load of rubbish. What? So that made um, Jim very nervous. So he stopped paying us. And also at the same time, the band that he was trying to support to run the studio and everything, they didn't know what they were doing. Well, we are in front of a one-of-a-kind Trident console, so oh, yeah. you don't definitely see this, we can say, ever. <laughs> exactly. We bought this in about 74, I think. All right, all right. That's a beautiful board, for yeah. sure. Well, yeah. Uh, I can, I can give you some, some basic history on it. Uh, Cherokee, when they moved out of Chatsworth, moved into what was MGM Music Studios. Yeah. That was owned by the MGM company over on Fairfax. Uh-huh. And uh, in the 30 plus years they were on Fairfax, they were basically the number one Trident user in the US, especially for the A-range. Yeah. Well, these things, the equalizers, these were more or less modeled after the full range Boltex and has those kind of curves, which is why these are so... Well, they're very broad. These musical, yeah. Yeah, I, I know myself the, the Trident EQ for his like mid-range, very like, oh, yeah. accurate and like in yeah, your well, face, but still like musical. Other... Trident never made anything like this before or after. It's like a Ferrari. Jim offered us a position to run the studio if I would do that um, instead of going on mercy ships again um, then he would supply a house for us to live in etc. I'm going to go into more of how that was uh, how we responded to that uh, in a little later in this uh, series. Eventually uh, we did sign up as I say for the DTS we joined the ship in, I think it was in North Carolina. And we joined the ship there, so we drove all the way up from Tampa. And uh, when we started our DTS, which was around about, I think it was three months or something like that. So eventually we worked our way down uh, to the Dominican Republic and to a place in the Dominican Republic, which was very, very poor. It was on the borders of Haiti. And uh, the people there, were suffered from starvation, lack of food, malnourished, uh, poor housing, poor living conditions. And we were based there in a place called Barahona. And uh, the people were just amazing. They were so pleased to see the ship come in because we were able to deal with a lot of their ailments uh, from medical needs to building homes again. There were so many miracles that we saw. Uh, I've never seen miracles like that in my life before. And I, all I can say is, why does it happen in needy countries? Why do we not see it so much in the West? Well, uh, I, I started to analyze this and I think it's more to do with not just having faith, but we in the West, we can go to the dentist when we need to do. We can go to the hospital uh, and have uh, operations to do this, that and the other. We can go to food banks. We can. There's all sorts of things that 
we don't have to actually get to be a, in a place where we need to pray to God and ask for him to intervene. We've almost bypassed that. Uh, whereas, <coughs> excuse me, whereas in these poorer countries, all they have is the Lord. The Lord God who supplies their needs and their faith. It's amazing. Why? Because when things get dire, and I can recite a few examples, they see God working in miraculous ways. Uh, it's incredible. So just want to say that at this stage, I'll give you a few examples as soon as I can get there. But you know, um, this is a time, as I said as well, when we weren't getting paid by Jim McCulloch, and so it was really challenging because we were not being able to pay our dues to, to the ship. And, and I remember the Lord really saying to me and challenging me, you know, saying, well, you thought you were going to supply all your own needs from your own back pocket, from, as I would relate to it. But are you still going to serve me now you have no money? Wow. What do we do? Not used to looking for a miracle financially. <laughs> so we were challenged. Were we going to trust in God? Were we going to trust in Jim McCullough? <laughs> Who's also saying, oh, I'll give you a job and a place to live if you come back and run the studio that we bought from you. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, you know, we signed a contract. I can go to the lawyers in Tampa and I can say, let's get, let the lawyers sort it out with Jim McCullough because he owes us a lot of money. And uh, I tell you, when I went uh, to the lawyers, these are the ones, by the way, at church. <laughs> and uh, I said, we're having problems getting our money from da 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 da, explaining that he was buying the equipment over five years, etc. And they said, have you got any money? Um, we need money up front to represent you. I said, I'm in Catch-22. I've got no money because of that. So I said, can't help you. So we didn't have any money to get our legal uh, bod uh, to actually help us to get our money from Jim McCullough. So, we were between a rock and a hard place. Now, Jim McCullough was a Christian. Uh, he, was, he was from a certain sect, so he wasn't quite traditional. So I came up with a, a scriptural principle, um, and it's in 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 1 to 10, which basically says that Christian people who have disputes with one another should first try and settle disputes by mediation or arbitration conducted by, say, leaders in the church and avoid going to court. Avoid going to secular courts because the, the scripture says, why should, they, why should we do that? Because uh, it's not a good witness. So uh, one day... It says in the scripture as well, we are to judge angels. So why would we not start now by following this scriptural example that we should be at least having arbitration? Um, and this is to the elders he's talking about. Because when I spoke to the elders in my church and told them about this, they said, well, we've never done this before and we don't really want to get involved. I said, but here's the scripture. It says, this is what you elders, you men in high positions should be doing. Bringing a reconciliation is the end result between a brother and a brother or a sister and a brother, whatever. So eventually I convinced them to hold uh, this arbitration between the disputed parties, myself and Jim McCullough. I had uh, my representatives and Jim McCullough had his representatives and all of them with a mind uh, to do this settlement in a godly way. The thing was, going back to the main dispute was the audio desk, uh, the Trident A-Range, which, as I say, we put $100,000 into restoring it. It's amazing sound. Uh, it's got an amazing history. 
Bohemian Rhapsody by the Queen, Elton John, uh, David Bowie, all their hits and uh, times uh, in that period. Um, and here I am uh, with this desk and this unwarranted comment uh, by this guy who'd said uh, that it was a load of rubbish. Yeah, it didn't look like a brand new Trident B range, which is an inferior uh, quality of sound electronics. Nevertheless, it meant uh, that no one knew the value really of this console, only me. Um, so the, the people who were representing us just didn't understand the value, they were just looking at it, that it looked old. So the bottom line is that the Connors did not receive the correct amount of money for all of their recording equipment. I think we got an extra 30,000, we'd had two months payments, so we, we were probably looking at 50 or 60,000, that's all we got back, it was ridiculous. They had so much more equipment as well, tape recorders, oh, just tons of kit. Probably, probably quarter of a million at least. So we're really out of pocket. So I, for the sake of reconciliation, as it said in the scripture, I agreed with the arbitrators, arbitrators and uh, came up with that low fund. I think it was about 30,000. And so I wanted to do something meaningful. I remember I already had the camera kit that was I'd paid out 50,000 for so I had a really good camera, an Ikigama camera, a good tripod and a, a tape recorder. So I, I used the 30,000 I think that I got in settlement for to buy uh, Lightwave which was a software package and a computer uh, to run the software on and um, and also it was something that was going to help us to, to for me, to make uh, programs, uh, Christian programs, because that was something that God was putting on my heart. And uh, yeah. And this is a calling which I'm going to talk about next. So this is after going to Romania and returning to the UK from Romania, yeah. Okay, so we used up all our finances again <laughs> uh, and basically had to start from scratch. Uh, we were well aware that this was not going to be easy with two young children of our own um, and now we're also needing to provide for our newly adopted baby, Rebecca. Yeah. Our trust was in the Lord again, of course, uh, to provide for us and by now we had had many miraculous experiences to draw on. Uh, so our faith was quite strong and we knew that God would look after us. God gave us the direction and vision uh, in which to pursue and what was the start is the Christian television in the UK. You know, that was going to be uh, something that God wanted us to do and I didn't want to go back to England, to be honest. But uh, anyway, so... Um, we began making programs that educated and encouraged others. Um, you know, trying to get other people to come into the kingdom of God and serve the living God and build their faith. And uh, anyway, rather than follow the desires of this world, which most of us can easily get sucked into. Um, and by the way, as it says in scripture, this will soon pass away. You know, this world and its uh, desires will pass away and come to nothing. So this is around the early 1990s and uh, there wasn't a 24-hour Christian television network in the UK at that time. Fran Wildish, who formed Vision TV, was putting out Christian programs for a few hours each week and from her base in Swindon it was. Uh, one day Simon Parsons, a friend of mine from church, from Cornerstone Church, who knew of our calling to start Christian TV in the UK that is, took me to meet Fran as she might be able to help us or at least encourage us uh, with our huge vision. When I saw and met Fran and, and saw what she was achieving uh, with so little kit really, I was so encouraged and it gave me the confidence that God could possibly use us to start uh, a 24-hour uh, Christian TV channel in the UK. By the way, it still took the next 12 years to finally come to fruition. 
But in the meantime, because of our mortgage on our apartment in Surbiton had been miraculously paid off, uh, we were now able to move back into it and we set up a work area uh, for me to make uh, the programs. But now we had an additional child in the family who needed her own bedroom. And our two boys needed their own bedroom. And as the apartment only had two bedrooms, Leslie and I slept on the sofas in our front room. Uh, you know, this was quite the norm when we lived in Romania. We could see other families doing exactly the same. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we thought, OK, we can do the same. We'll sleep in our front room on our sofas. And this meant, of course, that the children had their own bedrooms. How I became interested in learning about God, well, I think this is something I need to explain. It was in the mid-1960s that I was first contacted by the JWs. Someone knocked on the door and asked me, what part does God play in your life? And my reply was none. It was the first time uh, in my life that anyone had even mentioned God to me, and especially on my doorstep. Of course, I read scriptures and things at school and assembly times and our religious instruction teacher seemed more interested in literally beating us with a slipper across our backsides um, and I guess helping to teach us about God somehow in the middle of all that. But needless to say, I cannot remember one word he said about God uh, during these religious lessons. But I do remember the pain the teacher inflicted on me. <laughs> However, uh, I remember some of the hymns and the scriptures which were read out at assembly time. Uh, I say all of this because after some six years of, after leaving school, here there is someone standing on my doorstep who was politely inviting me to know more about God. I'd not heard of Jehovah's Witnesses before. Uh, I didn't know about their doctrines. And at that moment in time, all I was interested in was knowing more about God. So I agreed to begin a weekly Bible study with them. This soon led to me reading the Bible, the whole of the Bible, by myself. And I started at the beginning with the first book in the Bible, which is the book of Genesis. And in the front of my Bible, I made a note of where I had read up to, so I could keep a tab on where I was. And I soon learned that I was not supposed to be reading the Bible on my own, according to the witnesses, because they want you to follow the Watchtower Bible Society material, like, um, I suppose, the Awake magazine, the Watchtower, and other Bible books that they publish. I'd also attend meetings several times each week. I was hungry for the Word of God, and I continued to read the Bible every night. So, being dyslexic and, and, and having never read a book in my life, I found reading the scriptures so difficult. But I persevered, and it took me two, two and a quarter years, um, yeah, to finish reading the whole of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I also attended the meetings at the Kingdom Hall, the JWs held. I even shared what I was learning from the scriptures with my siblings. And eventually I discovered that what I was reading from the Bible on my own time, yeah, as I say, was not, just not lining up with the JWs teachings. I also became aware that my lifestyle was not lining up with some of the scriptures. So got to a point where I went to the elders in the local kingdom hall and confessed uh, my sin of adultery. And this ended up with me being disfellowshipped. It was made public um, by the elders through the whole of the congregation. I had the choice of being present or not being present, and I, I chose to be present at the time they made this announcement. Uh, it was truly embarrassing, yeah, humbling. However, I did deserve it. It was my fault, after all. Uh, and being disfellowshipped or disassociated uh, meant that I could still attend the meetings. And. Uh, no one was allowed to speak to you when you went into the Kingdom Hall. That was the, uh, the law, as it were, the rule, if you'd been disfellowshipped. So the men didn't talk to me. But the ladies in the congregation were very kind to me. And I remember saying to them, you'll get into trouble, you know. 
Yeah, you'll get into trouble talking to me. The elders will have your guts for garters. They didn't seem at all concerned. It was some time later, I think I was probably a late 20s, early 30s maybe, I came across the scriptures in Romans chapters 10 and 11. Uh, it mentions that God has not rejected his people, the Jews, and that we as Gentiles ought not to be ignorant uh, or arrogant about this sacred secret. And as the witness's own translation calls it, the sacred secret, uh, but in the, nevertheless, it talks about the Gentiles should not start thinking that they've taken over from the Jews and replaced the Jews. It says, look, uh, God has not rejected his people, okay? These scriptures uh, were so enlightening to me that I went to one of the elders at the JWs and I asked him, what is the JW position or understanding on these particular passages in Romans chapter 10 and 11? Um, they said, well, we don't have an understanding. And from that moment in time, I started to search everywhere I could to find out more about who understands this scripture. I went to the local synagogue in Kingston-upon-Thames and I spoke to the rabbi. He wasn't very helpful at all. In fact, I think he was a little bit suspicious about me and I don't blame him, you know. I'm a Gentile as far as they're concerned and, you know, not fully understanding it. But I also, uh, I wanted to learn Hebrew and I started to learn Hebrew when I was associated uh, with the synagogue. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to know more about God's people, the Jews, as, as a people. And I remember uh, again in that scripture, the Apostle Paul says, look, you know, God forbid that God had rejected the Jews because he himself is a Jew, and Apostle Paul, of course. I just couldn't attend the Kingdom Hall or a church organization anymore, and uh, because they basically thought the Jews had killed Jesus, uh, and, it, and it was God that rejected the Jews. So they had a completely different understanding, and here it is in the New Testament, you know? Quite plain for me to see that God had not rejected them. And there's a reason why you need to read that uh, for yourself because the, or, or get an understanding of it. Whew. There were other scriptures as well that helped me. Uh, Jesus said he came primarily for the lost sheep of Israel. Remember that? Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. And God's new covenant with Israel as well, which was mentioned in both Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, anyway. But little did I know that almost on my doorstep was Halford House in Richmond-upon-Thames. And that was under the leadership then of Lance Lambert, who was a well, well, he was um, a Messianic Jew. He, and he was well aware of the scriptures, the, as it was called, the sacred, secret scriptures in uh, Romans 11. But I wasn't aware of Lance Lambert's ministry until I met Tim Vince some 30 years later. And I wish I'd known because uh, they were only in Richmond upon Thames and I was in Kingston. So it would have been so easy for me to go to that church, or as you call it, that meeting place. Yeah. But I kept searching and for understanding and clarification as well. And, you know, so I decided to visit Israel for myself. I wanted to know more about God's people the Jews.
Leslie had been brought up as a Catholic and attended St. Philomena's Convent School in Carshalton, whereas I had no spiritual or church guidance throughout my childhood, none whatsoever. And only at the age of 21 was I beginning my journey to faith in Christ and starting with Jehovah's Witnesses. But please, 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 please note that I've spent the majority of my life following more the charismatic Pentecostal church teachings um, than being with JWs, okay? Just want to make that clear. So when Leslie and I moved to America uh, in December of 1982, uh, shortly after being married, we began to search for a church that we both were comfortable with. And we found Christ Community Church in North Himes Avenue um, in Tampa. And that was a good transition for both of us, really. In the time we were in Tampa um, at Christ Community Church, uh, friends of ours called uh, Gary and Susan Hickman, um, they introduced us to uh, a charismatic church, <laughs> which we attended occasionally, and where we began to learn more about how God was working and in the miraculous. Uh, with signs and wonders following, uh, following the preaching, that is. When we returned from our time on Mercy Ships, we were staying with friends in Sebastian, a small town on the east side of Florida. And we discovered that Jim McCulloch had stopped his monthly payments, um, which were for the purchase of recording the studio equipment. And that meant we had no income at that time. So we were down to what we had was a, a fistful of dollars literally five dollars. And we were driving across the state on I-4. We were going from Sebastian, which was more on the east coast of Florida, and we were traveling uh, towards Tampa. It was a, in a very rickety old van. It was just about making it. Uh, and we needed to see how we could resolve the situation with Jim McCulloch, and uh, for him really basically to start paying us again. The day before Jim had uh, said to me on the phone, he said, look, you know what? He wasn't happy with the people that uh, were going to be running the studio that he'd funded for, you know, because um, they just didn't know what to do with it. Um, so Jim said to, to us, it, it, look, if you guys, that's Leslie and I, come back uh, to Tampa, don't go on the mercy ships, and we will uh, just put all our attention to running the studios again and we he would pay us a wage i think it was thirty thousand a year he was offering and uh he'd give us a place to live in uh, one of his nice villas that he had very tempting uh, as we were talking about this uh, in the van leslie and i uh, we actually thought you know should we do this or should we go ahead with trying to serve uh uh, in Mercy Ships, uh, going to Tyler, Texas, and being part of the media team uh, for Youth with a Mission. But uh, we were literally just going past uh, Orlando. We were driving past through on I-4, Internet State 4, uh, and Leslie and I, were, as I say, were talking about this matter, and should we take up the offer, etc. We'd have a secure income, somewhere to live, uh, whereas we have no salary now. We couldn't afford to, to be volunteers with uh, Mercy Ships. And we've been driving for well over an hour by this time. And uh, all of a sudden, the tape machine, the tape recorder in the van just switched on and said, all you need is faith. I blasted out a full, a full volume. And Leslie looked at me and burst into tears and I knew that God was saying, we need to continue to have faith in God and not think about where the money was coming from and certainly not to take up this offer from Jim McCulloch. And, you know, as I said, I've been driving for over an hour and it was, why would the tape recorder just suddenly actually switch on? I'd been listening to that tape recorder uh, the day before, and I was listening to a preacher preach. So yeah, this was right in the middle of his preach, saying, all you need is faith. That was amazing. How did that happen? 
And this was the very time we really needed to hear from God because we could have taken that offer up from Jim McCullough. Anyway, it was later on and that day when we arrived in Tampa, it was, I think, a church in, in the north of Tampa, and we wanted to join uh, some friends uh, of ours, uh, Gary and Susan Hickman, uh, up there, because that's where they, the church they were going to. And uh, so we, we went there, and uh, we wanted to pay them a visit, but they weren't there at that particular evening. And so we had our two sons, Luke and Joel, with us, and we were sitting in the church, Remember, we had five dollars, that's all we had. And uh, the time for the offering came, and I felt the Lord was saying to me, we had to put our few fistful of dollars into the offering. Oh. Well, the bowl was starting to be passed around. I got out my five dollars, our five dollars. I said to Leslie, I'm going to put this in. I've been led to put it all in. And Leslie reminded me and said, you know what? We need to buy Joel uh, one of those things for his asthma. What do you call it? Um, you know, your puffer. We call them puffers. And uh, so we still need to buy that. But I said, no, God's telling me to put everything in, into the offering. So that's what we did. And uh, the pastor took the offering, we've got the offering in front, gives thanks for it, and then he says, God is telling me to give this offering to that couple over there. And that was us. Now we were <clears throat> in the, a prominent position, we were just tucked into the middle of the pews and things. And uh, when we checked the offering, there was $750 in there. We were <laughs> flabbergasted. Our $5 was suddenly turned into $750, which met a lot of our financial needs and provisions. It was just, I, I could only call it a miracle. Anyway, we've seen a lot of this over the last, well, 30, 40 years. <sighs> Seeing God in work in the miraculous, uh, especially in finances as well, because it's not easy working in ministry. Um, there have been times when we've had plenty, there's times we've had nothing, uh, but it seems that God always meets our needs. Uh, this is amazing. and. Uh, Anyway, shortly after this event, we got in contact with Mercy Ships and they said they wanted us still to join their media team, which was based in Tyler, Texas. And uh, we agreed to do that. But first, Leslie wanted to go back to the UK to see her mum. Sadly, her dad had uh, already passed away a couple of years earlier than that. But her mum missed her and she wanted to see Leslie and the grandchildren, uh, Luke and Joel. So they went back to England. I stayed in Florida and I kept in touch with my friends and one day Jenny Grine and uh, her husband Bill Grine, they invited me to dinner and said, uh, well, why don't you first come to the evening service at the church and then we'll go to dinner and uh, Jenny uh, and Bill's church services were not what I were used to. They were even a bit more charismatic. <laughs> uh, so I decided that I tell you what, if you want to, me to meet you at the church, that's okay, but I'm going to meet you after the church service is finished, okay? And I'll feel a bit safer that way. I don't want people having a prophetic word or word of knowledge and uh, all of that and laying on of hands. I, at that time, I just didn't want anybody doing that. So, I arrive. Um, at the church service, and I just check and look in the door. Yes, they're all up, they're all walking out. That's great. So yeah, I'll uh, go in. Well, this man looks at me rather strangely. 
And I thought it was something, I was dressed in jeans, as you don't do that in America. When you go to church, you dress up to the nines, you, your Sunday best, okay? All right? Well, they said um, something happened in the afternoon today. Well, no, no, no. First of all, he said, do you mind if I pray with you? And I said, if you have to, a bit rude, isn't it? I didn't mean to be so rude, but I was, you know, yeah, I said, yeah, okay, if you have to pray, sure. And he said, you had a phone call this afternoon. Yeah, I did. And I had this phone call from somebody I didn't know. I don't know how he got in touch with me. It was um, the pastor of a church called Harvest International. They'd asked me to be a cameraman to go to Eastern Europe with them. And that, um, you know, would I go with them for on this tour? Uh, they were going to be preaching the word of God. They wanted me as a cameraman. And I said, uh, I said, no, no, I'm joining Mercy Ships. Um, thank you for the offer. Very kind of you. Da, 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 da. So this man is now saying to me, you turned down going to Romania, Eastern Europe, with this ministry. And God wants you to go. What? And the power of God came over me. And it was like so powerful. It was a witness. And not only that, I'm going, how on earth did this guy know that I turned this down? I hadn't even told anybody. I didn't even tell Leslie or Jenny or Bill or anybody. So how did he know? And uh, eventually I, I stand up and, and I said, I'm going to go. I'll go. If God wants me to go, and that's very clear to me uh, that this was of God. So as I'm walking out the church, Bill and Jenny Grine are saying, you know, he's a real man of God. He is a prophet. And I said, yeah, he must be. He must be. No one knew that I had, had that call in the afternoon, three hours earlier. No one except God. And then Bill and Jenny said to me, you're not going, are you? I said, you bet I'm going. It's 3,000 miles away or whatever it is. I said, I can easily come back if it's not God, if it's something that's not, uh, not right. I said, but I'm not going to miss God. It's more important that I go out of obedience. And if it's wrong, it's not so bad. It's like, all right thousands of miles away but I can still come back you know so what so what happened next was I I call Leslie at home and I say uh, Leslie are you sitting down and she said yes she's in the UK remember I said well there's a change to the plans oh yeah what's that well you know we were going to Tyler, Texas? Yes. Okay. We're not going uh, at the moment. I've just had, the, and I explained the situation, I've got to go to Romania with this Harvest International team. We're going to be preaching on the streets in Timisoara, which is where Ceausescu had only recently been shooting his own people. There was a, a revolution in Romania and Ceausescu was eventually put to death by a firing squad. And now Harvest International want to go over there and preach in the streets. Great. God, Christians died here in this square. Oh, Doamne, au murit creștini în această piață. That these people could receive Jesus today. Ca acești oameni să poată să să primească pe Isus. And I praise you, God. I said, I'm going. And Leslie was amazing. And then she said to me, well, are you sitting down? I said, yes. Why? And she said, well, I've got something to share with you. Oh. Uh, she said that, um, you know, the apart our apartment uh, that we had in the UK, which we'd rented out uh, whilst we were in America, was about to be repossessed. Because it was a time when the interest rates suddenly jumped up to about 15% or something. Sound familiar? <laughs> to the towns we live in? Well, I said, uh, yes, I do remember that. And we'd agreed that just to let it get repossessed, right? Now, I've got to tell you this, not many women do this. 
when we knew it was going to be repossessed, I did have my camera equipment, etc. And I said, well, if we sell that, maybe we can put that towards paying the mortgage on the apartment. And Leslie said, no, God's called you to do the work of the TV ministry, so keep the kit and we'll lose the apartment. That is amazing, I tell you. That is truly amazing for a woman, and especially with children, to give up a home willingly for God uh, to have his way first. And that was for me to continue doing Christian TV. And so, yeah, okay, I'm sitting down, Leslie, and she says, well, yeah, that was about to be repossessed, right? Yeah. Someone's gone to the bank and paid off the mortgage, the complete mortgage. Amazing. So now we were debt free, still at a home, and uh, I, I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, gobsmacked. And this is just another example of how the Lord has provided for us. Yeah, I went to Romania, and that was another story, really just amazing things happened there too. I tell you, there's no end to what God can do and how he can use you and use other people to help you, yeah. Receive a miracle today, the miracle of the new birth. How many would like to pray with us to receive Jesus? How many would like to have their sins forgiven? Raise your hand, raise your hand if you want to receive Jesus.